evening. Do I have that? Am I on, Lori? Is anything registering on the board? First time. All right, welcome to worship on this fifth and final of our Lenten evening worship services. And uh, tonight we'll conclude our sermon series on forgiveness. Um, if you picked up a copy of the scripture, our scripture tonight is where Jesus himself teaches us what we now call the Lord's Prayer. And we will discuss that. Um, so obviously, um, <clears throat> our normal music leader is not here tonight, so you will have to suffer with my singing the lead part tonight. So um, when we come to the split part in the um, Let My Prayer Rise Up, the psalmody, uh, when we get that, if anybody wants to sing with group two, you may. I will be singing part one, so you may follow along with me if you like. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Did we put a... Is there an offering plate back there? Excellent. So if you have an offering, there's an offering plate back by the door. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I don't have an update on Larry Rogers to offer you. Um, just, what I, just what I said this morning. Um, he's stable. He's still, he's still on a ventilator, so following his triple bypass. So, um, Did she? I didn't see it. Okay, I'll have to check, but um, anyway, he's, he's still on the ventilator, so um, they're waiting for his, his dependency, uh, help me miss Ann, something about he, he's dependent on his ventilator at 65%, and when they get him to 40%, they'll take him off, does that sound right? Yeah, so I think 40 was the number she said they're looking for. It, it had gotten down to 50, but this morning it was back up to 65, so... They're waiting for that to level off and come down. And then they'll take him off the ventilator. In the meantime, he's still sedated. So, so please keep Larry and Nancy in your prayers. Um, she asked me to express her thanks because she knows you all have been praying for both of them. But she is surrounded by family, and that too is a good thing. Okay, uh, if you would take just a short moment of quiet reflection and prepare your hearts and minds for worship. Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. The light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us now, for it is evening, and the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness and shine within your people here. Joyous light of heavenly glory, loving glow of God's own face. You who sing creation's story, shine on every land and race. Now as evening falls around us, we shall raise our songs to you. God of daybreak, God of shadows, come and light our hearts anew. In the stars that grace the darkness, in the blazing sun of dawn, in the light of peace and wisdom, we can hear your quiet song. 
Love that fills the night with wonder. Love that warms the weary soul. Love that bursts all chains asunder. Set us free and make us whole. You who made the heavens splendor, every dancing star of night, make us shine with gentle justice. Let us each reflect your light. Mighty God of all creation, Gentle cries to light our way, loving spirit of salvation, lead us on to endless day. <coughs> hold on a second. Lynn, hold on a second, please. <laughs> My throat is given out. <coughs> May God be with you all. Let us sing our thanks to God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Blessed are you, creator of the universe. From old you have led your people by night and day. May the light of your Christ make our darkness bright. For your word and your presence are the light of our pathways. And you are the light and life of all creation. Amen. <coughs> Let my prayer rise up like incense before you the lifting up of my hands as an offering to you oh god i call to you come to me now oh hear my voice when i cry to Let my prayer rise up like incense before you, the lifting up of my hands as an offering to you. Keep watch within me, God. Deep in my heart may the light of your love be burning bright. Let my prayer rise up like incense before you, the lifting up of my hands as an offering to you. All praise to the God of all, creator of life. All praise be to Christ and the spirit of love. Let my prayer rise up like incense before you, the lifting up of my hands as an offering to you. May our prayers come before you, O God, as incense, and may your presence 
surround and fill us so that in union with all creation we might sing your praise and your love in our lives. Amen. If you would turn with me now to your bulleted insert. <coughs> Sorry. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to them, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> when we teach the fundamental principles of our faith, that class we call confirmation, in which all teenagers cringe when they hear that word, we typically follow Martin Luther's small catechism, in which he highlights three primary elements of our faith, the Ten Commandments, the, the Creed, and the Lord's Prayer, which Luther says any Christian should be able to understand and explain what those three things are. And while it is not openly listed as part of the Ten Commandments, forgiveness is a vital piece of both the Creed and the Lord's Prayer. And we heard it just now from the very lips of our Savior Himself as He taught His followers how they should pray. But before we get into this prayer, I want to address where we find forgiveness in the Creed. It's brought up in the third article concerning what Luther titles sanctification, which is just a fancy word for making someone or something holy. So let's review what Luther taught in his small catechism on this part of the creed. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What does this mean? Answer, I believe that by my own reason or strength, I cannot believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and preserved me in true faith, just as he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth, and preserves it in union with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and abundantly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. And on the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and will grant eternal life to me and to all who believe in Christ. This is most certainly true. Well, now, that little piece on forgiveness is kind of buried down there on page four, isn't it? Kind of hard to find. Why isn't that... Why isn't that front page news? Maybe it's just one of the many things that the Holy Spirit does for us each and every day. 
Luther doesn't really explain that. But listen to this, this explanation of baptism that I found from one of the key theological books on modern Lutheranism discussing promises made in baptism. What New Testament witness promises to baptism precisely responds to the two sides of what baptism mandates. Both aspects are concisely stated in the baptismal proclamation that Luke attributes to St. Peter. Here's what he says. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's in Act 2. So on the one hand, baptism forgives the sins of the penitents who submit to it, to baptism. On the other, it gives the blessings of the community into which baptism initiates them. Two mandates. In characterizing baptism as the forgiveness of sins, Peter's formula is exactly that which Matthew, Mark, and Luke all describe as John the Baptist's practice. He appeared baptizing in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The identification of baptism with forgiveness is so close in Acts that the mere phrase forgiveness of sins seems normally to refer to baptism. The mere phrase forgiveness of sins seems normally to denote baptism. Have you ever thought about your baptism like that? Baptism makes us part of God's church where we find that forgiveness. The creed mentions the forgiveness of sin, but this is not a general possibility of remorse and reprieve that we confess. It is actually the event of baptism. Baptism is passage from the old age into the one holy community and her freedom. That God allows and executes that passage is itself the forgiveness of sin. You know, I had to go looking in the large catechism to get a little bit more, right? So listen to this. This is Luther, I think, at his best. We believe that in this Christian church, we have the forgiveness of sins, which is granted through the holy sacraments, baptism, communion, and absolution, as well as through all the comforting words of the entire gospel. That's where we have forgiveness. Toward forgiveness is directed everything that is to be preached concerning the sacraments, and in short, the entire gospel and all the duties of Christianity. Forgiveness is all their focus. Forgiveness is needed constantly. For although God's grace has been won by Christ and holiness has been wrought by the Holy Spirit through God's word in the unity of the Christian church, yet because we are encumbered with our flesh, we're never without sin. Therefore, everything in the Christian church is so ordered that we may daily obtain full forgiveness of sins through the word and through the signs, that is the sacraments, appointed to comfort and revive our consciences as long as we live. Although we have sin, the Holy Spirit sees to it that it does not harm us because we are in the Christian church where there is full forgiveness of sin. God forgives us and we forgive, bear with, and help one another. We need forgiveness. We need to receive it, and we need to offer it. And that is what we pray in the Lord's Prayer. In the fifth petition, forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. All right, I'm going to spare you the small catechism. I'm going to jump right to the large catechism on that one. This petition has to do with our poor, miserable life. That's so Luther. Although we have God's word and believe, although we obey and submit to his will and are supported by God's gift and blessing, nevertheless, 
we're not without sin. There it is again. We still stumble daily. We still transgress because we live in the world among people who sorely vex us and give us occasion for impatience, wrath, vengeance, etc. Hmm. Nothing new under the sun, is there? Here again, there is great need to call upon God and pray, Dear Father, forgive us our debts. Not that he does not forgive sin even without and before our prayer, Luther says. And he gave us the gospel in which there is nothing but forgiveness before we prayed or even thought about it. But the point here, he says, is for us to recognize and accept this forgiveness. Why would we have a hard time accepting forgiveness? Here's why. For the flesh in which we daily live is of such a nature that it does not trust and believe God. Ouch. It is constantly aroused by evil desires and devices so that we sin daily in word and deed in acts of commission and omission. And so our conscience becomes restless. It fears God's wrath. It fears God's displeasure. And it loses the comfort and confidence of the gospel. Yeah, it does. Therefore, it's necessary constantly to turn to this petition of the Lord's Prayer, the fifth petition, for the comfort that will restore our conscience. <coughs> Let no one think that he or she will ever in this life reach the point where they do not need this forgiveness. In short, unless God constantly forgives, we're lost. This, this petition is really an appeal to God, not to regard our sins and punish us as we daily deserve, but to deal graciously with us, forgive as he has already promised, and therefore grant us a happy and cheerful conscience to stand before him in prayer. Yes, I'm still quoting Luther. I couldn't think of a better way to say it. Listen to this, though. Where the heart is not right with God and cannot achieve this confidence, it will never dare to pray. If you can't accept God's forgiveness, you won't want to pray you won't feel right about bringing it to God in prayer. But a confident and joyful heart can only come from the knowledge that our sins are forgiven. Meanwhile, a necessary but comforting clause is added, as we forgive our debtors. God has promised us assurance that everything is forgiven and pardoned on the condition that we also forgive our neighbor. Inasmuch as we sin greatly against God every day, and he forgives it all through grace, we must also forgive our neighbor who does us harm and violence and injustice and bears malice toward us, etc. If you do not forgive, do not think that God forgives you. But if you forgive, you have the comfort and assurance that you are forgiven in heaven. Not because you forgave, for God does it altogether freely out of his pure grace, because he has promised it, as we hear in the Gospels. But he has set up this condition for our strengthening and assurance as a sign, along with the promise which is in agreement with this petition that we hear in Luke, Forgive and you will be forgiven. Therefore, Christ repeats it immediately after the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, our reading for tonight. Part of Luther's own journey of faith was how he gained a deeper understanding of God's grace and a greater appreciation for the forgiveness that we are all offered because of Christ. And his explanation that you just heard is well worth considerable time to reflect on. 
He gave us a couple of key points that I want you to remember. We all need forgiveness every single day. We need to ask for it, we need to hear it, and we need to be reminded of it. Secondly, it is in our nature to turn away from God. That's pretty much the story of the Old Testament, right? That's what we did over and over and over again. The world around us encourages us to turn away from God. And because of that, it's natural for us not to believe that we are forgiven. And when that happens, it's even more likely that we will grow apart from God. And then it snowballs. You know anybody that hasn't been to church in a while? Have you talked to them about it? Usually what they'll say is, I just don't think I should come back now. It's been too long. All the more reason to come back, to hear this again, so that you can stand in front of God and you can pray to him and you can be reminded what he wants and that he is just waiting to forgive you. But that's not what your heart tells you when you're separated from him for so long. And the longer it goes, the worse the problem gets. We should pray this prayer, this, specifically this petition of the Lord's Prayer, in such times. Number three, we should never think we don't need forgiveness. For either of two reasons, either that we think we're without sin or that we think we're able to make up for our sins on our own, that we can somehow pay them off. We should never allow ourselves to get to that place. And finally, we are commanded to extend to our neighbors the same forgiveness that has been extended to us. This is mentioned more than once in the Gospels. It's important. Forgiveness is, if you have anything like the experience I have had, It's rarely easy, but it's absolutely necessary. (coughs) If you're paying attention to what's going on in the world right now, you know that we have a perfect example of what life without forgiveness looks like. The wrongs in our society, or what society deems are wrongs, are never forgiven, ever. Did you watch the Brett Kavanaugh trial? His hearings for confirming him to the United States Supreme Court? He was on trial for days on end for an accusation of something he may or may not have done when he was in high school. It was never proven. Witnesses could not be found. Some of it was proven to be untrue, and yet there are people who are still absolutely furious with him for what he was accused of. They will not forgive him of even that. And that's just one, one paltry political example. There are so many more. How's that working out for us as a country? How are we doing? We have more information at our disposal than at any other time in our history as a human race. That little device in your hand that you use to talk to your neighbors and your family, you can access 97% of human knowledge through that device in a matter of seconds. You can get more information right now than any human being has ever been able to access. And we are less forgiving as a people than we have ever been. Wherever you look, it just seems like everything out there is simply awful. I contend it's this lack of forgiveness that is a big reason for that. So over the last several weeks, as we've looked at this thing called forgiveness from a variety of different angles, I hope that you've come to a similar understanding as I now have. We're commanded to forgive each other. But this command that God has given us, like all the other commands, is truly for our own good. 
when we don't forgive others, it eats us up inside. It robs us of our joy and our happiness and our peace. And when we are not forgiven ourselves or when we don't accept forgiveness, it too eats us up inside and robs us of our joy and our happiness and our peace. We cannot live in this world without being forgiven and without forgiving others. We simply cannot. As our Lenten journey nears its end, let's remember what happens at the finish line. Forgiveness is achieved for all of us in a very costly way. Let us never take that for granted. Let us remind one another of what a great gift it is, a gift that is for all who want it. Let us all be ready to share that gift whenever we see that it can be shared. Most of all, let us help one another to accept it so that our hearts may be kept free from despair and restlessness and instead be kept in the comfort and confidence of the gospel, exactly as God intended it for all of us. Please pray with me. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. The light shines in the darkness, and the, and the darkness, darkness has not overcome it. An angel went from God to a town called Nazareth to a woman whose name was Mary. The angel said to her, Rejoice, O highly favored, for God is with you. You shall bear a child, and his name shall be Jesus, the chosen one of God most high. And Mary said, I am the servant of my God. I live to do your will. My soul proclaims your greatness, O God, and my spirit rejoices in you. You have looked with love on your servant here and blessed me all my life through. Great and mighty are you, O Holy One, strong is your kindness evermore. How you favor the weak and lowly one, humbling the proud of heart. You have cast the mighty down from their thrones, uplifted the humble of heart. You have filled the hungry with wondrous things and left the wealthy no part. Great and mighty are you, faithful one. Strong is your justice, strong your love. As you promised to Sarah and Abraham, this forevermore. My soul proclaims your greatness, O God. My spirit rejoices in you. You have looked with love on your servant here and blessed me all my life through. Mm -hmm. Of mercy. 
see, hold us in love. In peace, in peace, we pray to you, God of mercy. For peace and salvation, we pray to you, God of mercy, hold us in love. For peace between nations, for peace between peoples, God of mercy. For us who are gathered to worship and praise you, God of mercy. For all of your servants who live out your gospel, God of mercy, hold us in. For all those who govern that justice might guide them, For all those who labor in service to others, God of mercy, grant weather that nourishes all of creation, mercy. Keep watch on our loved ones and keep us from danger. For all the beloved who rest in your mercy, God of mercy, help us, comfort us all of our days, keep us, hold us, gracious God. Great and merciful God, source and ground of all goodness in life, give to your people the peace that passes all understanding and the will to live your gospel of mercy and justice. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God, remember us in your love and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Let us bless our God. Praise and thanks to you. May God the Father bless us and keep us. May Christ be ever light for our lives. May the spirit of love be our guide and path for all of our days. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share that peace with each other as we depart. <laughs>